Richard, do you want to read that first chapter of Ruth? Or yes. Yeah, you would. Yeah, okay. I'll do that. Yep. So if you want to turn your Bibles to the book of Ruth and chapter 1, and Richard's going to come up and, and share with us. Okay, while, while you're finding Ruth chapter 1, uh, I do want to obviously say thank you so much for your incredibly strong partnership in the work of Living Hope. It's a, a real, real strength, not only in terms of the Rwanda link, but the uh, support of the wider work as well. <coughs> the Rwanda link, as uh, <coughs> everyone's prayed a fair bit, is so important <coughs> because uh, something I felt, you know, over the last five years, people have said to me, who is going to succeed you? I don't think I was looking particularly unwell or anything, <laughs> but uh, it, uh, who's going to succeed? Who's going to succeed? And uh, one, one really was asking God, well, well, who? And some of our boys have been very actively involved. But then that moment came and I shared, I think, uh, oh, Alison, I think, was having to babysit on this meeting. But I, I shared how... God had really laid it on my heart that I already had about 15 successes. Not just one, but by the baton going into the hands of all these other people, they will succeed. So it doesn't have to be centralised as such. You know, it's releasing people. And, well, that's what Jesus did, didn't he? He had those disciples and he said, go into all the world. And uh, that's why we're here today because people obeyed and did that. But thank you very, very much. We'll continue to keep in touch and inform you of developments. But uh, I'm not retiring. Uh, the uh, Africans have a nice phrase. They say, retiring. In other words, you're putting a new tire on the car <laughs> and it's not actually winding down. Elaine is here, she's heard every word. <laughs> Right, um, I, I will now read from Ruth 1. It, it's uh, quite a pivotal chapter, really. In, you, you kind of get the grip of the whole story in, in Ruth 1. Okay. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab. The man's name was Elimelech, his wife's name was Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Marlon and Kilian. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem, Judah. They went to Moab and lived there. Now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died and she was left with her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other Ruth. After they lived there about ten years, both Marlon and Killian also died, and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. When Naomi heard in Moab that the Lord had come to the aid of his people by providing food for them, she and her daughters-in-law prepared to return home from there. With her two daughters-in-law, she left the place where she had been living and set out on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord show you kindness, even as, uh, as you have shown kindness in your death husbands and to me, to your dead husbands and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye and they wept aloud and said to her, we'll go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, return home my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have any more sons who could become your husbands? Return home my daughters. I am too old to have another husband, even if I thought there was still hope for me, uh, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons. Would you wait until they grew up? 
Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters, it is more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord's hand has turned against me. At this they wept aloud, then Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But uh, Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realised that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped arguing with her. So the two women went on until they came to Bethlehem. When they arrived in Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the woman, uh, women exclaimed, Can this be Naomi? Don't call me Naomi, she told them. Call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So Naomi returned from Moab, accompanied by Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, arriving in Bethlehem as the barley harvest was beginning. Let's pray, and then we'll share some thoughts on this story. Lord Jesus, we do thank you that your word is always relevant and uh, although there are things in this story that we uh, don't uh, readily understand and there are uh, issues that are quite complicated, we also thank you for the simple story of your hand upon someone bringing them through a crisis and bring them to a place of great blessing. And Lord, we just pray for one another today that you would speak into our lives, whatever we're facing, and that you would help us to find the strength and direction that you alone can give. Lord, I pray you help as I speak in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> In many ways, it's, it's an interesting little book that's been popped into. Uh, you've got all the judges and you've got Samuel to come and Kings and Chronicles. Uh, but this is a lovely story. And uh, it's great how there's rich variety in the Bible. That it isn't all one type of literature. Uh, tremendous range of literature. Straight history, as I say, stories, true stories and uh, just the way that God's at work in people's lives. It's called Ruth, but uh, this first part particularly, and in some ways right through the book, it could almost be called Naomi, because there's so much of her story bound up in this. But Naomi is going to be used after a season of feeling there's been no fruit, nothing's been happening, it's just disaster after disaster. She doesn't realise how she's going to be used by her care of Ruth and bringing her back to Bethlehem eventually. But that is going to open the door for Ruth to meet Boaz and for Boaz and Ruth to get married. And you don't have to get your handkerchiefs out, but uh, you know, it, it, there is quite a sort of a, a romance going on here. And the outcome of it is, of course, that they have a child who will be... Uh, the great granddad of David, the king of Israel. So it, it, it's just remarkable how this girl comes out of the uh, dust, out of the past, into a present which is very, very much uh, relevant for the salvation of the world. And where does this baby get born, who's going to be the saviour of the world? Bethlehem, as we've been looking at here. So. What's behind these events? We don't know for absolute certain, but 
as I reflect and look at it, I think Naomi was to some degree the victim of some very difficult decisions. Should they have ever gone to Moab? Uh, you have to ask that question because it wasn't exactly the most fruitful time of life, was it? It was absolutely opposite. It was a disaster. And from time to time, I guess we've all handled situations which we <coughs> thought at the time this was what we were meant to do, this was good, but for whatever reason it falls apart and we have to find God in it. And although the language is fairly strong, you might think Naomi was a fairly miserable person. I don't think she's actually a miserable person at all. If she was that miserable, Ruth wouldn't have wanted to go back with her. So it's obvious that there was something attractive about Naomi. Uh, as well as the reality of her grieving and working through what's gone wrong. You know, uh, Moab, of course, was a pretty terrible place. It was a very heathen place. Uh, you know, you wouldn't want to have your holidays in Moab as a Christian. It, it was a very, very troubled situation. And uh, one of the kings of Moab actually was uh, renowned to have sacrificed his son. So they didn't actually uh, go into a spiritual hotbed of wonderful things happening and God moving. Uh, they were going from almost one situation to a worse situation. Now, Elkanah dies. I, I don't want to put all the blame on him, but I suspect that knowing the culture of the time, uh, Naomi probably didn't have a lot of choice in it. And we wouldn't like that today, would we? Uh, and in reality, it doesn't happen. I mean, Elaine is in charge. But, uh, <laughs> but, but what I'm saying is this. What I'm saying is, is that it's so, so easy. Alcala said, we're going to go. To what degree did they always say, oh, that's a great idea. Let's go. We'll go tonight. Uh, to what degree did Naomi feel, I don't really like this idea, but um, if my husband says I've got to go, I've got to go. And sometimes things happen in life, don't they, where we've followed dutifully the counsel, not necessarily the husband or wife, but maybe another leader, uh, different things. We try to do it right, try to be submissive, try to be obedient, not be rebellious and loads of questions. But sometimes things are not what they appear. She loses her husband, and again, without going into great sort of detail, um, Alison will now know, and uh, others of you know, being a widow in poor parts of the world is a very, very troubling thing. I mean, being a widow anywhere, of course, is obviously a very hard thing, but uh, for widows in some parts of Africa today, in Rwanda today, uh, being a widow at this time meant that, uh, how did you live? Because it was a very male-dominated society, and uh, if the man of the house isn't there, well then, you know, you, you're in a very, very tough situation. And then the two sons. Well, we don't know how old they were when they arrived in Moab, but uh, we know they were there about 10 years, so I guess they were maybe 10 or 12, and after that 10 years, they were old enough to have married. And although this is speculation, I don't think they were married that long, the two boys, because there's no children. Now, I do realise and appreciate that sometimes that is what people handle for all of their lives. And uh, it's not a curse from God. But uh, in those days, they thought it was. You know, they thought, this is, this is terrible. Uh, this is the one thing that uh, a woman should be able to do. And we thank God that we look at it differently today. But in those days, and in some parts of the world today, it would be seen as a massive failure if you were not able to have children. And we know that uh, Abraham got into all sorts of a mess, really. He's a great guy. We look forward to seeing him in heaven. But we know that he did have a child with Hagar, which was not the right way to go around things. But Naomi is here in this situation. No husband, and uh, she has no sons, 
but she does have these two daughters-in-law. And they do seem to be uh, pretty nice girls from what we can see. I mean, we don't have great description, but uh, there was a sense of loyalty. There was a sense of faithfulness. Of course, uh, you can get the impression from what Naomi says to them, they did have family at home. It's not as if they had no one to go home to. They were thinking, we want to stick with Naomi. But Naomi clearly, uh, she's like all of us in a way, that uh, one part of her, you think, what a strong woman of faith. You know, this is somebody who's outstanding. How are they coping? But one also senses from some of the words that uh, Naomi speaks, that she was under quite a big cloud. And uh, I, I would actually challenge how she was thinking. I don't blame her in the sense that we'd all think that way quite probably in her situation. But I don't think she's got it right when she says, the Lord has done this. I know God's sovereign. I know he watches over all. But I think in her depression, in her grief, she is interpreting it all as if God is not on her side. And yet, when Ruth is wanting to persuade her to let her go back to Bethlehem, there's, you know what I'm going to say, there, there are significant things that Ruth says. Where you live, I will live. Well, that was good. Uh, where you die, I will die. Now that was a very, very significant thing. One of the things I've noticed uh, working in Africa is that not in every African country, but in some African countries, there is the tradition that, uh, say you were born in Kasunu, in the west of Kenya, and uh, you moved to Nairobi, which is quite some distance away, it's an hour's flight, probably six to eight hours on the road. If you die in Nairobi, the tradition is, is that you get buried in Kasumu, which is where you were born. And uh, even today, there are plenty of, uh, of our black churches who are raising money almost on a regular basis so that someone who has died here in London can be taken back to wherever they were born. It, it means a lot to them. Now, I think for us, we, we wouldn't be quite so preoccupied with, with that. We, we see it in more practical terms. I mean, my mum died fairly recently. Well, there was no question of her being uh, sort of buried in Sussex so that we could visit her grave. Uh, she needed to be born where she was, uh, buried where she was. <laughs> but uh, what we're looking at in this passage is Ruth is saying, where you die, I will die where you live, I will live. I am prepared to be buried in the same area where you are. And that, culturally, was a massive, massive decision. You know, that sort of really severing roots. But we all know that when we follow Jesus, sometimes we are called upon to do things that appear radical to others. To do things that seemed unreasonable almost. How can you do that you know, as Christians? How can you tithe when you've got these uh, big finances, uh, you know, a house roof to be done? There's lots of things that in the natural sense, you say, that doesn't add up. But what we have to do is what God says. And Ruth is saying, I will be buried where you are. But then, you know the point I'm going to make. She says so clearly, doesn't she? Your God will be my God. Now that was radical. That was far more radical than being willing to be buried outside of where she was born and outside the country. This is incredibly radical. And why, why does she make that conclusion? Well, I believe as I've been inferring all the way through, that she saw in Naomi godliness. It wasn't just sort of human loyalty. It's much deeper than that. 
And it's the loyalty that uh, Jesus inspires, isn't it? Why do we love him? The Bible says very simply, we love him because he first loved us. He was prepared to die for us. He was prepared to give everything. He was prepared to live, leave heaven with all its glory and comfort to come to earth. And I often uh, like to remind my friends in poorer parts of the world that Jesus didn't have... Um, you know, electricity in every room of the house. He didn't have running water. He didn't have a flush loo. All of the things that uh, we take for granted in this part of the world, well, he didn't, he didn't have those. <coughs> he left heaven with its absolute purity. But he came into a sinful world. I, I don't know about you, but uh, having come to Christ at an early age, occasionally you go to an event, it may be by one of your family, it may be a friend who you feel <coughs> obliged to, to go along, and you find yourself in an environment and you think, I don't belong here. And it's not just because the music is extra loud, I mean, that, that's a hearing issue, that's not, it, it's other things, it, it's the language that you start to hear. and. Uh, the standards and, and the preoccupation with how much can you drink in an hour and, and all of that and, and you kind of feel, I don't belong here. How did Jesus feel coming into our world, coming into the world that we live in and still live in today? He must have felt, this is so awful. But why was he here? Well, he wasn't here because of the view, although I think he liked the view looking from a mountain over the Sea of Galilee. He was here to save, to deliver us, to deal with our sin and to bring us to the Father. That's why Jesus came. And we love him because he first loved us. Ruth experienced a love for Naomi, not because, you know, Naomi was a kind of a paper doll who, who never did anything wrong. And, and no, no. Ruth saw Naomi for what she was, a grieving widow. And yet, and yet, there was something of the beauty of Christ. She says, don't call him, uh, Naomi, call me Myra. The Lord has dealt with me severely. Well, she was feeling that way. But what she wasn't saying was, and I don't want to follow him anymore. Notice when they arrive back, when they arrive back, they find that the barley harvest was beginning. And uh, that, that's very special because they left because there wasn't a harvest. And when they returned, there was <coughs> a harvest. What I want to say, really just trying to bring this together, during this lockdown, we have faced uh, substantial challenges. Uh, in the very early days, you had to be looking over your shoulder if you went out for a walk more than once. Uh, and all sorts of the challenges of the lockdown and, uh, and the concern and the social distancing and making sure that you remembered your mask when you go into the co-op or wherever. <laughs> Sorry, it wasn't an advertisement for the co-op. <laughs> but... Um, yeah, it's been very different. Nothing as radically different as widowhood, losing your children, but different. And even that loss of what was a fairly typical pattern of life, that loss, we have to come to terms with. And some have struggled far more than others. Naomi and Ruth is a wonderful story for people who face very big changes and challenges, but who both walked with God. And the ultimate expression, as I said much earlier, is that uh, Ruth has a child with Boaz and she slots into this divine line that will lead eventually to Jesus. Isn't it good that God, in his mercy, 
Whatever our past, whether we've handled great tragedy, difficulty, whatever, whatever, we have been grafted into Christ. Mm. We are now servants and sons and daughters of the living God. Mm. And our future is absolutely fantastic. Mm. Uh, it, it's more than a barley harvest. Mm. We're going into that place of no sin, no sorrow, no death, no sickness. Uh, and we will join those who have loved Jesus and gone before us. Hallelujah. We do have sorrow. Don't, don't, don't be a super Christian. I remember when Augustine lost his wife. Um, Augustine, lovely man, uh, his wife was Teddy. And uh, she was a very special lady. I, I would call her almost my favourite Rwandan sister. Because uh, I, I just saw such godliness in her. And I remember when we uh, helped her and Augustine to come across to a conference in Kasumu. Uh, she had a gift for Elaine. And, uh, and she said to me, Augustine and I have never been away before. We've never got away. We've never had a holiday. And she was so grateful. Well, sadly, Augustine uh, dropped her off one day to preach in a meeting and he went off somewhere else and then he got a phone call to say uh, Teddy has just collapsed and died. I think it was a heart attack or something. Mm. But she just suddenly had gone. And it was so good to have my African friends like Bishop Stephen Kuguro and others because we, we noticed that Augustine didn't grieve. At least not, and not, didn't seem. And he, he, I think, he was almost feeling, but I'm a Christian, so, you know, I, I'm not allowed to have a good weep or whatever. I need to bottle this all up. Well, as I say, it was great to have my African friends, because I wanted to make sure that I was giving a godly response, not a European response. And uh, Stephen said, no, we've got to encourage this man to grieve. And I say to you, if there are things, whether it was during this week, whether it was weeks, months ago, you are not wrong. You are not letting the Lord down to grieve. That is a perfectly reasonable thing. Godly sorrow actually brings blessing. Worldly sorrow just brings a trap. And you are stuck in it for the rest of your life and never move on. But godly sorrow can lead to repentance. Godly sorrow can lead to health. And so Naomi, she was able to grieve, but also able to walk with God. And everything comes good. And Ruth comes good. The Moabite girl, who never could have dreamed when she was able to understand and talk, she could never have dreamed that one day she would meet Boaz and that she would have her son who would come into the line that we've described. She couldn't possibly have envisaged that. And you don't know what God can still do for you. Right. Whatever your background, whatever your years, and remember some people came into the most fruitful years of their ministry when they were getting on a bit. Well, the important thing is that we have a sovereign God. She did get that right. No, we did get that right. He is a sovereign God. And yet, we know he's full of compassion, full of love, and he will take care of us as we walk with him in reality. Not in superficiality, but in reality. And I did uh, do a set of studies on Bible figures who struggle with depression and uh, Merv uh, did uh, copy the notes that I made on uh, Ruth, the story of Naomi and Ruth. There's nothing wrong in those notes, but don't be surprised if they bear no resemblance to what I've said to you today. <laughs> but uh, God bless you. Thank you again for your very wonderful love and support and uh, we'll keep, info keep you informed. Thank you. Thank you.
Actually, you did stick quite well to your notes. <laughs> Fantastic. Brilliant. Well, Richard said something in his preach which is absolutely fundamental for us is that before we ever loved God, he loved us. And another aspect of our relationship with God is that when we're not always faithful to him, he's totally faithful to us. And that's the sort of whole emphasis of our last hymn today. If it's coming up on the screen in a minute. Just let Sue, I'll, I'll ramble a bit more so that Sue's got a chance to get it up. Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father, there's no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not, thy compassions they fail not, as thou hast been, thou forever will be. We're living in a world, aren't we, with depression. I was listening on the radio when we were coming up to church this morning and there was a young girl that said, that put uh, online, as they do these days on Facebook, of course people could like or dislike or comment, and she'd have I don't know how many thousands of hits talking about the fact that since lockdown she's been totally depressed. And I listened to all of the things that she was depressed about, and they were all things that are not that important really, going out. Okay, yes, if you're on your own, you want to meet up with friends, I know that. But going out, socialising, going for a drink, going, doing this, doing that. And I thought, how worldly was all of these things that she was promoting? When in realist, as we've been seeing over the last few weeks, in what we've been preaching here from the front, Jesus said, I've come that you can have life, that you should have it to the full. And that's what God wants for us, isn't it? Yes, we will be depressed. We will have times of, of feeling like nothing on earth, as much rotten as anything. But remember, great is thy faithfulness, O oh God my Father. Let's humble sing below our breaths these words together, shall we? Mm -hmm. 